All right, we are going to get started. Actually, starting on time this time instead of starting late. Uh, if you guys were here for every night so far, other than the first night, me being up here might be kind of confusing to you. Uh, this class initially was kind of designed and set out so that uh, Pastor Ron and I were going to go back and forth as we taught through uh, faith among uh, the faithless or keeping faith in a faithless world. And uh, I had some pretty significant life changes that happened in the last uh, three weeks. My wife and I are still finalizing the process, but we were able to adopt a baby girl, which has been seven years in coming. Really exciting for us. And uh, as any of you who have ever seen a baby would know, uh, a little uh, life and priority and schedule changing as well. So... Uh, Pastor Ron did me a solid, and he was willing to take all of his that he was going to teach scattered throughout Red Life and lump them all together all at once uh, so that we could figure out, like, which direction was up again in our own home. And so now I'm here. I'm going to finish out tonight and next week uh, for our series. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're actually going to kind of step back for a second, look back at kind of where we were week one, kind of our introductory idea. And I'll be honest with you, because of how things have played out, my initial plan that I had, because, you know, planner, uh, to, to go this every other class thing that Pastor Ron and I were going to do, and how those were all going to fit together in like this really masterful way, uh, is totally in the garbage now. So I'm changing everything that I was actually going to teach between this one and next week, but I think it's going to come together well for us regardless. A couple of things. Uh, first off, this is the last night for the book table that is upstairs. And so if you're a person who wants a book, there's a bunch of them there, first off. But second, they're like half off of the sticker price that's on the book. So they're books that we have vetted. They're books that we uh, would use here and have used a ton for different classes, for biblical counseling, for a lot of different things here. Um, but we wanted to make different resources available to you, our church body, uh, for the period of time that we were doing Red Life. So if you want books at a crazy, crazy low price, and there's not just like novel like size books up there, there are booklets up there as well that are incredibly helpful. Uh, there's one that's up there by Bob Kellerman that I noticed was on the table and was kind of surprised that I hadn't poached it off of the table myself already. Uh, but he has a booklet that's on anxiety and how do we handle anxiety in a way that's biblically faithful. How do we actually view anxiety through the lens of what scripture says and how do we deal with it in a way that understands that God is sovereign and in control of all things? Uh, there's other ones that are up there on pride and humility. Uh, there's parenting, there's marriage, there's, if you can think of a topic, there are books up there on those tables for it. I would encourage you to take advantage of that. Um, real quick for our students, sorry adults, my assumption is you guys can probably figure it out on your own, but students, any note takers among you here? I'm going to ask you guys a couple of questions, and if you get them right, I'm going to give you a book. How about that? Yeah. So, uh, does anybody remember who the two primary characters were that we talked about in week one? Week one. There were two different Bible stories, specifically, that we talked through. Daniel? Yeah, that's one of them. What's the other one? Got to get them both. Uh, uh, you, uh, Easter. Easter's? Esther. <laughs> Esther. Esther, yeah. Um, I'm not going to walk in front of this because it's going to make a terrible sound, but you can come get that. <clears throat> uh, does anybody remember uh, from that week, there were three primary things that I said that you could end up being if you're uh, kind of not handling the idea of keeping faith in a faithless world well. There were three core identities that you might have. Henrik? Which one? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Throw that one there for you. It's a little different one than she just got. And let's see, what was Ron's first class on? Anybody on this side now? Anybody remember? Pastor Ron? You don't know him as Ron. You didn't hear me say that out loud, and it's definitely not being recorded. Mm hmm. Who just said that? All right, you can have a book. <laughs> we'll go outside of teenagers now. Do you want uh, Faith Among the Faithless? This is a book on the book of Esther. Or this is a really good book on conscience. Okay. Um, Let's take your pick. All right. 
All right, and uh, last one, uh, Ron, Pastor Ron, taught last week on what? That's correct, but what kind of perseverance? There was perseverance that depended on, that was week one, perseverance that depended on God. What was week two? Perseverance that depends on us? Yeah. There you go. All right, we are going to get rolling. So, uh, week one, as the first question asked, uh, we talked about a little bit of why it is that we as people are starting to find things so disorienting in our culture and in our world right now. Why, why when we look at what's going on around us, when we look at how people are interacting with one another, when we look at the direction and shift that seems to exist within morality and with what, what we see as right and wrong in our culture, what, why it feels so off. And we talked about how the reality is, is that for really the last, like, uh, until about 35, 40 years ago, uh, Christianity was very well thought of culturally. Uh, from about 380 AD, when Theodius named Christianity the official religion of Rome, until like the 50s or 60s here in the United States, we were in this era called Christendom which was this time where to be a Christian often meant to be successful. Meaning that if you wanted to do well in business, for example, you would be a member of First Presbyterian Church or First Baptist Church or First Methodist Church. Because if you were, it was assumed that you were going to be honest in your work. And so we kind of use the idea that, that if you wanted to go and get your muffler work done, you didn't want to go to the pagan. You wanted to go to the Christian who was going to uh, live honestly and give you a good rate and everything else. Although being a Christian certainly does not excuse us from being sinful con artists. Is that right? And then about 35, 40 years ago, we hit uh, what was essentially the rise of the Enlightenment, or this idea that we can no longer believe in or rely on what is the supernatural, things of God, a creator, uh, miracles, anything like that, but, but instead must rely on logic, that man couldn't possibly be eternal or have a soul in any capacity, but instead is effectively a brain on a stick, that man is just a body that is here temporarily and then gone. And when that is all we are defined as, that changes how we behave. When all there is to live for is the here and the now. When there is not actually eternal consequence, but, but the worst thing that might happen to me is that I cease to exist the motivation to actually live a life of righteousness greatly lessens. We said that the Enlightenment was an attack on the soul. It was an attack on eternity. It was an attack on creation. And it was a rejection of anything that seemed supernatural. We use the phrase that Christianity went from favor to perceived foolishness in about 30 years' time. From favor to foolishness in about 30 years' time. And so we saw this shift that took place uh, on the ideas of marriage and human sexuality, uh, the ideas of gender, that virtue and righteousness were no longer given on the basis of morality, but rather on the basis of, have you been offended? Or can you make an argument for how you are a victim? We talked through the reality that, that in our culture today, acceptance and affirmation and celebration is required of all lifestyles, of all ways of living, of all thought processes. And if, if you don't do that, if you don't affirm, if you don't accept it, if you don't celebrate, you're an abuser. You're a bigot. You're a monster. Which puts us in a very peculiar position as believers. And we said that there were three potential responses that we tend to fall into as Christians. Temptation one was the temptation to fight. To fight and to divide. We use the example of the social media warrior. The person whose entire 
day, their, their whole life being outside of maybe going and holding down a job is to go on Twitter or go on Instagram or go on these YouTube videos and argue with people all day long because they will know us by our hate, right? That they will know us by how well we can disagree with them. They will know us by how well we can argue with them and how we can articulate an idea to them. No. The temptation, too, was to hide. You know, that it's, it's become uncomfortable to be a believer. It's become uncomfortable to follow Christ in a culture that would say there is no Christ. And so we keep Jesus to ourselves. We live with the idea that our faith is something we keep quiet. We pray maybe with family for meals that would never take place outside of our home. We might attend church, but we don't talk about it. And we certainly aren't going to share what we believe. It's the whole idea of the ostrich putting its head in the ground and trying to pretend like it's not there. And lastly, temptation number three is compromise. Compromise. We talked about the reality that for a lot of us, and, and if we're honest, all of us, we look much more like our culture than we would care to admit. That, that if we're honest, if we're honest, our lifestyle does not look all that different. Our motivations do not look all that different. And the ways in which we live our lives and stumble and sin do not look all that different from everyone else around us. And then we looked to two stories in Scripture. The story of Daniel and the story of Esther. And we held them in contrast to one another because the reality is those stories are written in parallel. Both of them written about a person who's been exiled from their home. Both of them written about a person who's been placed into a wicked culture that goes against everything that they believed or knew. One story about a man named Daniel who walked in faithfulness. A kind of faithfulness that, that for you and for me, honestly, can be kind of intimidating because you can go throughout the entire book of Daniel and you just got nothing on the guy. Like we look at like King David in the Old Testament, we're like, okay, well, he committed adultery and, and murder and he did that census and he did all these things that are wrong. So like he's a normal human. And we look at Moses, we're like, he hit the rock and he yelled and he was angry. So, you know, we, we got him too. He's normal like the rest of us. And, and over and over and over, we can look at all these people. But we look at Daniel who's facing things that, that honestly, in comparison to what we face on a daily basis, is his version is quite extreme. Meanwhile, we have a bunch of Christians running around who claim that they were being persecuted when they were asked to wear a mask during COVID. I don't care what your opinion on that is. You weren't persecuted. And then the story of Esther and her cousin Mordecai. So Daniel lived out his exile situation with faithfulness, whereas Esther and Mordecai were actually dwelling in significant compromise. That there was a statement from Esther chapter 2. There was a Jew named Mordecai living in Susa, the citadel. And that that phrase contains within it what should be both ironic, what should be startling, and what screams compromise. Because Mordecai is not a Jewish name. Mordecai is a Persian name after the Persian god Marduk. Because Mordecai was a Jew, and he was taken during the Babylonian exile. That means he lived in Jerusalem. He saw what it was. He knew about the temple. He knew about Yahweh. And yet, here he is, living in Susa, the citadel, the highest positions of political power, 
of popularity and a position within that city. We see him dwelling there. We see that he's standing by the gates, which is where they would have debate and discussion over all kinds of philosophy and religion and thought. And we see that not a single time throughout the entire book of Esther is God mentioned at all. And yet in both stories, in both situations, we see that God works in mighty ways in spite of sinful people. God works in mighty ways in spite of sinful people. There was a Jew named Mordecai living in Susa the Citadel. There was a Jew with a Persian name living at the center of power of a conquering empire. There was one of God's people who'd lost or discarded his identity and embraced the way of life of a foreign world. And there is each of us. Compromise is a powerful thing. And the reality is is that, that as Christians, that position of compromise sometimes sometimes it looks like we are just participating, right? Sometimes it looks like we just are walking with our world and we are in agreement with everything that they do. At the beginning of our first week, we went over a few statistics from the State of Theology survey that came out at the beginning of this year. And if you remember the statistics, compromise within the church Compromise within evangelicals, looking and believing just like the world does, is significant. Just for case and reminder of a couple of those, it was some 37% of evangelicals believe that gender is a matter of choice. 37% of evangelicals polled. Somewhere near 30% of evangelicals believed that the Bible's condemnation of homosexuality only applied then, but does not apply today. That a significant percentage of evangelicals, even though they would say the Bible is their authority in life, also do not believe that the Bible is entirely true. that a significant portion of evangelicals, people who would claim to be Christians, who would claim that this is truth, who believe that Jesus is in fact the only way that we might be reconciled with God the Father, also believe that God accepts the worship of all people and all religions. See, those numbers are painting a story for us that is not an encouraging one. It's a story of compromise. It's a story like we see in the book of Esther. And we're going to spend some time there next week. But, but tonight we are going to go back to Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So you pray with me, and then we're going to read a large chunk of scripture. And we are going to get rolling. Let's pray. Father God, we we are so desperately in need of your help as we try to evaluate our own hearts and our own lives, as we, we try to see and understand the ways in which we may be walking in compromise that we might be blind to. God, it is so tempting for us as Christians, as followers of Christ, to try to be a certain thing, to try to appear like a certain thing. And God, it's so impossible to actually do it. God, it is so tempting for us as followers of Jesus when we see what's happening in the world around us to run and hide, to keep our head down, to stop proclaiming what's true, 
and to care more about our comfort than others' eternity. God, we're asking that you step in and do a work. We're asking that you step in and intervene in our story. That we would not be a people who are looking around us thinking that somehow something went wrong with culture. But that we would remember that culture was never going to be going the direction of you. Just the opposite. And that you've shown us that all throughout your word. And that we have a purpose as followers of Christ to walk in faithfulness in a world that seems like it's gone mad. So God, help us. God, convict us. God, lead us. In your name, amen. Hopefully you've got a Bible with you or a device that you can open up a Bible on. Uh, This week, we'll be in here a fair amount. Next week, we will as well. So if you don't have one with you this week, this is your tip for next week. Bring your Bible with you because we are going to be reading some large sections of Scripture. But tonight, go ahead and open up to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3. We're going to read through verses 1 through 30. Yeah, we're going to read all of it. It's a lot, but I think it's important. Daniel chapter 3, starting at verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits, that's 90 feet, and its breadth 6 cubits. He set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then King Nebuchadnezzar sent to gather the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that the King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, and the prefects, and the governors, and the counselors, and the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of that image, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you're to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down in worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the people heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, uh, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the people's nations and languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Verse 8, Therefore, at the... <coughs> At that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you've appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They don't serve your gods or worship the golden image that you've set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I've set up? Now, if you're ready, when you hear every kind of music, the sound of the pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every other kind, to fall down and worship the image that I've made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace." And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? If you've got a highlighter or a pen, you should underline or highlight these next verses. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. 
The expression of his face was changed again, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind the three and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace was overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took the three of them up. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste, and he declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. He answered and said, But I see four men unbound, walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near the door of the burning fiery furnace, and he declared, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire, and the satraps and prefects and governors and the king's counselors gathered together and saw that the fire had not any power over the bodies of those men. The hair of their heads was not singed, their cloaks were not harmed, and no smell of fire had come upon them. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I make a decree. Any people, nation, or language that speaks anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be torn limb from limb and their houses laid in ruins. For there is no other God who is able to rescue in this way. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. So if you grew up in the church, you're like, yeah, we, we know that story. We've heard that one before. I saw the flannel graph growing up. There were flames. They seemed neat. I watched the VeggieTales version. There was a large chocolate bunny. But this story actually has a lot to say to you and I as believers. You see, the reality is, is that if we are actually following after Christ... If we actually are Christians, Christ followers, we'll face the same kind of pressures to assimilate and bow down to the idols of our culture today. See, it's interesting that when you see what Nebuchadnezzar did here, he, he built a nondescript golden statue. We have no idea what the statue was of. We don't know if it was of him. We don't know if it was of some other god. We just know that, that he made a statue, and there's a reason for that. Nebuchadnezzar wasn't a moron. He, he, he was the king, the ruler of the most sophisticated nation on earth at the time. He knew that his empire was stretching across tons of different countries and provinces, people groups, languages, religions, and King Nebuchadnezzar, similar to the one who would come after him, Darius and then Xerxes, who we talked about in the first week, you hear about more in the story of Esther, they had this kind of rule as they would go in and take over uh, these little countries. And the rule looked a little bit like this. You can keep your gods. You can keep your rulers. You can keep your little government thing that you have set up. You can worship whoever and whatever you would like to worship, but, but you also have to worship what I tell you to worship. You have to bow when I tell you to bow. You can't look that different in my kingdom. And so as we see that he calls all these people together, the, the, the call is you must bend the knee and worship whatever it is that I tell you to worship. The statue itself didn't carry all that much significance. It's interesting, when you look throughout most of the Old Testament, whenever a, a, a conquering kingdom would come in, 
and they would set up their idols and they would set up statues for their gods, they're identified. This one isn't. It's left vague. It's, it's left kind of ambiguous and nameless because it's symbolic of, of a greater idea that says, you will bend the knee when I tell you to bend the knee. You will worship what it is that I tell you to worship. And the reality is, is that we live in that very kind of society today. We live in a society that says, believe whatever you want to believe. Worship whatever you want to worship. Live your life to the best that you can today. You need to make sure that you celebrate everything that everyone else is doing. You need to accept and affirm, but... But you, you can worship God if you want to worship God until it gets a little inconvenient for people. <laughs> until they realize that worshiping God means, in fact, that we cannot affirm, accept, or celebrate sinful lifestyles. See, this is the idea of pluralism. And it seeks to kind of assimilate us into the public culture by making us privatize our faith. So you privatize your faith. You keep it at home where it belongs. You don't bring it out into the marketplace. You don't bring it out into the public square. You privatize it to yourself because it's yours. But don't, don't try to push that on anybody else. Certainly don't try to get anybody to join you in what you believe. And the statistics are showing what happens when we privatize our faith. And so what I want to kind of argue here tonight is that our culture has set up a lot of significant golden images that it is calling for you and for me to worship and bow down to. And there are a ton of these. Like, I'm just going to pick a few of them for us to kind of touch base on here. But but the reality is is that we need to understand that that they exist, that they're there, that there's an expectation that we bow down and worship them. And we also need to understand that a lot of times we already are and we just haven't realized it yet. So we're just going to start off with the easy one. Sexual pleasure and the expression of my identity and however I choose to see myself displayed. Sexual pleasure and self expression at all costs. See, a lot of us in our culture have fallen victim to this already. There's studies that are done now where, uh, this was back in, I want to say, like 2017. There was a study done uh, to see, basically, uh, for two groups of people. One group of people who was taught about uh, sexuality and actual sexual activity one way, and then another group that was taught about it in a different way. Group one was taught, go out and have as much sex as you can with as many people as you can because there are no consequences to those decisions. That is a primal activity that you have to pursue, otherwise you can't be a complete person. The other group of people were told this, sex is a gift from God designed for marriage. And you should abstain from that until you're at a place where you have committed to another person in a marriage covenant and then pursued them in that relationship according to God's word. Between those two groups, as they were polled in college, the difference was 5%. The question posed to them was, are you a virgin today, freshman year of college? Of the group who was taught, go out and have as much sex as you can with as many people as you can because there are no consequences, 23% were virgins their freshman year of college. Of those who were taught, 
the biblical perspective of sex and marriage, which is good and right, 28% were still virgins. And you're like, hey, good job, church. 28%, look at how you beat those pagans. 5%. Less, like, (laughs) that that number difference in, in a statistical survey is so minute. It's nothing. There was effectively no difference. Why? Because the church is bowing down to the idol of sex. See, this is something that is constantly around us. And and what's fascinating is that you've seen this shift happen from the 1960s with the production of birth control and the whole idea of the free love movement and, and everything that was attached to that through now. So what started with that argument shifted into the idea of my body, my choice. Sexual revolution led to the abortion argument and is now shifted once again into my body, my vision, my body, my identity. My body is whatever I think that it is. And this is being pounded into our heads from every direction. It's a remarkable thing that somehow within the last three years, what we saw initially was a race issue that turned into a gender issue overnight. And an interesting question for you is this. When's the last time you heard BLM? When's the last time you've even heard somebody talk about George Floyd? You don't. Because the narrative today is gender. The narrative today is you are what you want to be. And it happened overnight. See, we are far more compromised in this than we would like to admit that we are. When I'm counseling people that are coming into my office, my question to them, whether male or female, is not, have you ever struggled with pornography? My question to them is, when is the last time you viewed it? Because the assumption is that it's there. The assumption is that it's there. Because it's been normalized. And because in spite of knowing what God has said, We've compromised. And we have people who are running around and they're claiming Christ. They're saying, I follow Jesus. And yet while they're dating, they're they're shacking up, they're having sex, they're pursuing all kinds of intimacy that they want and desire at all times, whenever they feel like it, because culture has deemed that okay and appropriate for them. Because we've bowed down to a golden idol. And it's a fascinating thing to see the narrative of what happens when you won't. What happens when you won't bow down to this idol? Because you cannot separate sexual ethics from gender anymore. They are now considered mutually exclusive, like they have to go together in our culture. And when you're not willing to affirm that, and accept that, and celebrate that, there's something innately wrong with you. And you are a hateful abuser and a bigot. See, growing up here in the UP, this for me was kind of a a foreign idea. Like, I grew up here, I wasn't really exposed to that much besides deer, trees, and like, and a flannel. And so I was here from, you know, birth until 24, 
And then at 24, I moved down to Indiana. And you're like, Josh, you moved to arguably the most conservative state in the country. And you would be correct. But it was fascinating when I moved there and I moved to a college town. And I got a job at Starbucks, of all places. And so here is large Uper Josh down in Lafayette, Indiana, right across the river from Purdue University, working for one of the most liberal companies in our country. And there were some fascinating things that happened while I was there. One, as a straight male, there was only one of me that worked at Starbucks. Everyone else that worked there was either female or homosexual. There was no one else like me. And that was weird. Because to that point in my life, I had never actually met somebody who identified as a homosexual. There was a kid that people teased in high school saying that he was one, and I have no clue whether he was or not. But I had never met one. And all of a sudden, I'm there, and I'm like, I'm in Sodom and Gomorrah. Where have you brought me to, God? I don't even know what to do in this place. And I'm engaged to my now wife, Angela. And when the people who I worked with at Starbucks found out that we were engaged and not living together, they thought I was insane. And when they found out that we weren't sleeping together, like, I, I won't even repeat the things that they said about me. But the, the reality is, is that what is now normal is not to follow Scripture's protocol and design for sex and marriage. That's laughed at in our culture. It's mocked in our culture. And that was over 10 years ago. Another golden idol that Christians struggle with pursuing is the idol of business for profit at all costs. Business for profit at all costs. This is a ruthless, cutthroat way of living that says this, I will sacrifice anything and anyone in order to make more money. I will sacrifice anything and anyone in order to make more money. You see, money is this kind of insidious idol that exists out there for us because it fills two voids. For, for the person who, who loves money in a conservative way, their bank account is thick. Their bank account is loaded. And they rejoice in the fact that they will never spend money on anything, but they have security and safety in the numbers that they see when they open up their checking account. It's the idolatry of comfort and security that comes from having money so that you never have to rely on anything or anyone else. And then on the other side of that road, the opposite ditch is actually still the love of money, but it's the person who finds their comfort and their security and their identity, not in how much money they have, but in the things that they've purchased with it. And so I will either find my comfort in how much money I have accumulated or I will find my comfort in the things that I've purchased with my money. And both people look at each other like they're fools, not realizing they're doing the exact same thing. And yet we live in this world, in this culture that says you need to get more money at all costs, no matter what, in order to live your best life now. And so we've got a bunch of dads out there who have completely checked out from their families, dads in our church, who have sacrificed their wives and their children to work more hours, to bring home more money, to buy things that they don't need with money that they ultimately don't have, to impress people that they don't like, because they're bowing down to an idol that will never, ever fulfill.
the number of people who, who I talk to on a regular basis that talk about the reality of they had a dad, but they never knew him. That they had a dad who worked really hard to bring home a paycheck and they were always provided for and they took great vacations and they always had new Nikes and all of this different stuff, but they had no relationship with their father. And no, this does not just apply to men, but in the church, this is where we see it most prevalent. That in business and in work, for the goal of more money to bow down at that idol, we will sacrifice anything and anyone, and the first people we sacrifice are family. And it's not something that only exists outside of the church, because the temptation is just as real for me. Because I can put in more hours. I don't get paid anymore, by the way. But I can put in more hours, and I can find my identity in what I do. And I can bow down at the idol of work for my worth. And at the end of the day, it's empty. And if I sacrifice the things that God's given me to be of my first importance, which is my relationship with him, my relationship with my wife, and now my relationship with my daughter, that I am bowing down an idol that has no place in my life. The reality is, is that there are people who are in the church who, who look exactly like the world in the way that they conduct their business. And so they're maybe just on this side of the line of legality. They're not known for being an honest person. They have a reputation that says, don't work with this person because they will cheat you all while proclaiming Christ. We bow to the image money. Last one. This one, uh, I'm going to lose a lot of friends all at once. It's actually perfect. So teens who are in here, this one's going to be like, hey, this is you. And then parents, this is how you enable them to do this thing. All right. So I'm going to lose all of you at once. It's going to be great. <clears throat> As a youth pastor, one of the greatest struggles that I ever walked into, and I'm not a youth pastor today, but I was for a long time before I came here, was the golden idol of sports. And that sounds silly. Sports are fine. You can enjoy sports. They can be a decent activity. But sports have gone to this new level in, in the home where it is now a multi-billion dollar industry in our country. Multi-billion. In 2017, it was a $15.7 billion industry. And it had over doubled to that point in time in less than 10 years. It is far more extreme today. And in 2017, Time Magazine, so not a Christian thing, not, not anything that would be like trying to support biblical family views, Time Magazine identified that the average U.S. family was spending up to or beyond 10% of their annual income on their children's sports. 10%. Why does that number sound so familiar? Oh, that's right. That's right. It's, it's what God designated as a number that we should be giving back to him. And yet... We have families who have made it abundantly clear to their children and their teenagers that the most important thing in the world is them pursuing their passion. And so parents will spend an obscene amount of money going to hotels, paying for meals, paying for equipment, traveling every weekend so that their kid can go and be on this certain team so that maybe they'll get a scholarship. And so here's the reality. Kids, I'm glad that you like sports. I kind of liked them too until I realized that music was way better when I was younger. But in all of the time that I've been alive and worked with teenagers, and that's been thousands of them, I've known one, 
one who has a chance of ever dreaming of being a pro. One. Parents, your kid's not going to be a pro. Your boy's not going to be the best quarterback in the world. The NFL has 32 teams, and the chances of your kid being the quarterback for any of those is zero. And yet we sacrifice everything for it. Saying, well, what if if their life just can't be complete without this thing? So we search for our identity in it. We live vicariously through our children and their enjoyment of this thing. We pour money into it saying, well, maybe they won't go pro, but they'll get a scholarship without realizing how flawed that logic is. Because if you just saved all of the money that you poured into those traveling teams from the time that they were six to the time that they graduated high school, they would have more money saved in the bank from you not spending it on the sports team to begin with. I love sports, by the way. I love watching football. It's great. But what I hate is seeing families who have taught their children that sports are more important than God. And parents who have taught their kids that their kids' enjoyment of a thing is more important than their relationship with Jesus. Play sports. Enjoy sports. But if they are a God in your life, then you've got to get rid of them. Follow the trail of your time, your money, and your attentions. There you will find what you worship. There you will find what you worship. Holy smokes, the time is going super fast. Um, Maybe not for you, but it is for me. We're going to take, I'm going to follow the wrong example, five minutes, five minute break, bathrooms, There might be water left. I don't know if there's snacks. Abe's not here, so you're on your own. Uh, If you want to uh, come up here and complain at me, questions, comments, concerns, cheap shots, you know where to find me. And so we have identified some of the problem. The problem being that we live in a culture that, that demands and commands that we bow down to all of the idols that our culture worships. And part two of the problem is we do it pretty willingly. Part one of the problem is that the idols exist and are encouraged in our lives. And part two of the problem is that we actually pursue them and participate quite willingly. Which leaves us in a bit of a conundrum. Because what are we supposed to do? When we have such a bent towards sin, when, when, when idols like that are so tempting and alluring for us, when, when our world has gotten so good and making sin seem so appealing, and when standing for what's true often carries with it significantly negative consequences. See, of those things that we just talked about, sex, money, and essentially hobbies, none of them are innately sinful. Sex is a good gift given to us by a holy God who designed it for our enjoyment and our joy within the confines of marriage. Money is something that God has given to us and entrusts to us as a resource and something that we're called to steward and use well to provide for our families, to bless others, and to further the work of God's kingdom. Not innately bad. And hobbies and passions and things like sports and everything else like that. It doesn't have to be just sports, by the way. That was just an example. It could be a thousand other things. They weren't our idea. God is the one who is creative and who who even gave us the ability to, to have shapes to make the ball and the hoop to throw one through the other. Like man is not so creative that we came up with all of these things. We just created it all. No, we didn't. God is the one who designs all things. 
There is no note that will ever be played in any song that wasn't God's idea because he created music and sound. There is no piece of artwork or painting that has a color that didn't come out of the imagination of a holy God. We just work with what he's given to us. But unfortunately, mankind is really good at taking God's good gifts and breaking them with sin. We're really good at it. And we've been doing it from the beginning. We've been doing it from the beginning. And so part of the things that's going to keep us from from being a people who look exactly like our culture, and we're going to talk a lot next week about the importance of not just being like, "Ah, I need to run from our culture then, I need to get away from all of it. That doesn't work, and we'll explain why. Tonight we're talking more so about compromise and looking like our culture. Next week we're going to talk about the dangers of being combatant against our culture, or combative against our culture. But if we want to be able to actually resist and fight against the idolatry that exists in our world, we need to have a theology about God that goes deeper than my pursuit of my best life now. We need to have a theology about God that goes deeper than my best life now. See? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego have a pretty impressive statement that's made. The statement that's made by not being willing to bow is impressive. That shows some moral fiber, maybe uh, a a, uh, willingness to stand against what's wrong. But in, in verse 17 and 18 we see that there is far more to their theology about God than than we maybe have understood to that point. And so if you remember, leading up to this, King Nebuchadnezzar is saying to them, all right, boys, one last shot. I was told that you wouldn't bow. We saw you. It was obvious. You were standing. Everybody else was, you know, bowing. So here's the deal. I'm going to cue up the band one more time. Horns, bagpipes, etc. Can you imagine what that would have sounded like, by the way? Like the instruments that are described there? That's distracting. Um, so that, that, that ruckus is all about to rip again. And you get another shot. Just bow. Just bow. Bend the knee. Show that you're willing to get in line. And we'll just move on happy as can be. But if you won't, show me the God that will spare you from my hand. And then we see verse 17. And there are three statements that are made in 17 and 18 that are incredibly powerful. They said this, if this be so, that you're going to burn us, you're going to throw us into a furnace for being unwilling to do this, Our God, Yahweh, the God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. He can. He can. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. We believe that he can. We believe that he will. But check out verse 18. These three words are incredibly important. But if not, but even if he doesn't, we believe that he can, we believe that he will, and even if he doesn't. There is a trust that exists from these three young men in the sovereign power and plan of a holy God that is remarkable. And if we are a people who are pursuing after God, who would look around our world and say, you know what? I would have a lot more comfort in my life if I was just willing to cheat in my business or sacrifice my family more to get more money. 
But I believe that God can take care of us. I believe he can provide for us, and I believe that he will. But, but even if he doesn't, I won't bend the knee to this other thing. Because even if he doesn't, I know he's good. When it comes to sex and intimacy, the thought of if, if, if I am not willing to have sex outside of marriage, how will I ever get a spouse? How will I ever find somebody who will marry me? This is something that comes out in, in girls specifically. The fear of if I'm not willing to give my body away, then how will I ever get married? First off, I would pose this question to you. If that's what it takes in order to get married, then you don't want it. And then to be able to say, I believe, I believe that God can provide me with a godly spouse. In fact, I believe that he will. But even if he doesn't, I can still pursue him. I can still find my completeness in him. I can still experience full joy in him. I believe he can. I believe he will. And even if he doesn't, he's still good. See, having that kind of an understanding about God, an understanding that says this, God may not spare me from the furnace, but he will walk with me in it, is everything. You see, as Nebuchadnezzar looks into this furnace and he sees these four, there were three, there's a fourth. What's beautiful about this story is it is giving us a picture. This is what you see uh, referred to in the Old Testament as a type of Christ, a type of Christ. Nebuchadnezzar says that the fourth in there looks like, depending on your translation, it will, might say the son of God or a son of God or a, a son of the gods, depending on your translation. But this is, this is called a theophany, a theophany, which is, it is the kind of physical representation of Jesus before he comes incarnate in the flesh in the New Testament. And there are a few of these that you see throughout the Old Testament. This one in particular is beautiful because it is a picture of a savior who walks with his people in the midst of trial and tribulation. The King Nebuchadnezzar looks into the furnace and says, I see a fourth. And they walk inside together. And the fire has no power over them. You see, having a right theology of who God is, is so important. A theology that says, I believe he can, he has the power. I believe he will because I believe his character is innately good and he desires good for me. But even if he doesn't, I still trust because he's good. And when we understand the reality of Christ, when we understand the reality that, that when we walk through trial, even if we are not delivered from the uncomfortable reality that exists within it, he is walking through it with us and better has walked through it before us. The way that we keep faith in a world that is seemingly going mad is to remember that Jesus has experienced everything that we will experience. That Jesus understands every temptation that you and I will experience. See, we, we think about Jesus often, and we think about him, you know, being tempted in the wilderness. And, you know, the, the, the biggest temptation he faced was turn rocks into bread. Or that the biggest temptation he faced was to show how powerful he was by getting the angels to come down and, and save him before he fell. 
And we forget about the fact that Jesus was traveling for three years with his, his followers performing miracles. And so the reality of the temptation of wealth, of sexual immorality, of power, of fame, of comfort, of every kind existed for him every day on a level that you and I can never understand. You see, we, we like to think that, that the whole reality of Christ in flesh was easier for him because he wasn't a sinner like us. But for him, temptation would have been ramped up a thousand times because I have none of those abilities that he had. To know that, that Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane on his knees, praying to his father, saying, God, if there is any other way, let this cup pass from me. I believe that you can. And so he prays again, God, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. I believe that you will. Nevertheless, but even if you don't, he has modeled, modeled for us in perfection what it means to walk, not pursuing idols, but pursuing after a heavenly father who made us and cares for us. The first step, the first spot for a believer to start seeing beyond the idols that appear like a forest in front of our face now is to gaze on the beauty and the sufficiency and the perfection that is Christ. And it is as we gaze on Jesus, who he is and what he's done, that all of those other things stop seeming so impressive. I think it was providential that God saw fit to change the plan for red life this time. Because what we got to do was to take three weeks where Pastor Ron masterfully walked us through the reality of the gospel in our lives. Where if you were at a place where you had uncertainty about Jesus, about what it means to have a relationship with him, if you were at a place where you had uncertainty about whether or not your salvation was actually secure, if you were at a place where you were starting to wonder, maybe this Jesus thing didn't work for me. Maybe the gospel just didn't change me the way that it did other people. You got to hear somebody who has been faithful for a lifetime explain exactly how we can know we have assurance of salvation. We got to hear him explain exactly how justification works that I have been justified by Christ. And because of his work on the cross, I am positionally seen as perfect by a heavenly father. That I'm being sanctified, which means that because of his work, not because of my own, I am daily growing to look more like him. You see, when we look at the problem like this, the problem of idolatry, It can be really discouraging when we see how often we run after them. But when you understand and remember that it was never based on your work or your efforts to begin with, that there is a heavenly father who loves you and has done all the work of reconciling you to himself, that you are fully equipped and capable of rejecting what the culture would call you to bow to and pursuing after Christ. Let's pray. Father God, you're good. Father God, you're good when we aren't. You're faithful when we are unfaithful. You're a promise keeper when we are promise breakers. And you will complete the good work that you've started in your people. 
So God, I, I pray that tonight, that, that, that each of us that are here, that each of us who have heard this would, would wrestle with what are the places that we have maybe tried to find our satisfaction and our joy in the idols of our world rather than you. God, that you would be breaking our hearts and leading us in conviction to repent, showing us that happiness is not found outside of you. To show us that happiness is in and of itself fleeting and that you bring something far greater with joy and comfort and goodness and peace. God, help us change because we know that change without you is not possible. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your son. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.